talked about the fall of humanity or original sin. John Wesley tells us that the fall has to do with human pride. Adam and Eve think they're smarter than God and are capable of finding a better way to happiness and holiness than the way that God provides. Excessive pride leads to runaway self-will and by and living by self-will and not God's will makes us believe that we have all the answers and we no, no longer need to follow God. We now re refuse to return to God's love, God's love that is always present, and the love of God is, a, is extinguished now in our souls. So now what? How do we get God back into our lives? Well, this is where the Christian church talks about being saved. Now, many times in my life, I've, many times in my life, I've wondered what it means to be saved or why I need to be saved. I mean, I usually feel pretty good about life, think I'm a good person, pay my taxes. I usually go to church. I'm kind to elderly people and children. So is there something so fundamentally wrong with me that if I'm not saved from this design flaw, that I am constantly living in danger? Many of you may have had similar thoughts. For the most part, you don't break laws. You're probably good law-abiding citizens. You're kind to people. You give of your time and talents to your community. You don't have evil thoughts. I won't make eye contact. I'll say that again. Most of you don't have evil thoughts. And life with its ups and downs is usually pretty good. So is there some design flaw with you that needs to be remedied? I thought... A good topic to start our year off with would be to talk about salvation today. Salvation is probably one of the most widely discussed topics in the Christian church. Some of you may have heard people talking about being born again, or maybe some of you even know people that can tell you the exact date and time because they wrote it down in their Bibles of when they were saved. You may have been to a church or seen a church on television where the pastor will have what's called an altar call. The pastor will ask people if they would like to come down front to the altar and publicly profess their faith in Christ. They say a, what's called a sinner's prayer, and then the preacher proclaims them saved. So I guess the question for today is, what do I need to be saved from? It seems there are different opinions about this, and if you ask 10 Christians, you'll probably get 12 different answers, but there are those who think the world needs to be saved from the villainous other, like the Muslims or the gays, and then there are others who think the world needs to be saved from those Christians. Then there are people that think they need to be saved from going to hell, or then there are still people that think that they're currently living in hell and that they sure would like to be saved from today. For Wesley, salvation does not consist merely of going to heaven because it's not solely an afterlife experience, but a present thing. While Wesley calls salvation a present thing, he does not mean that salvation happens all at once. Rather, he means it's a presently occurring thing or an ongoing process. Wesley believed that salvation is the entire work of God from the first dawning of grace in the soul until it is consummated in glory. Now before we move, move on, I'd like to be clear about one point. When we talk about salvation today, this is not some sort of a checklist that we go through. I'm not asking you to say, okay, I'm, I'm here now, now I'm moving to the next point, now I'm moving to the next point, even though as Methodists we do like a methodical approach to life sometimes. Feel free to laugh at that. That was a joke. I practiced that in the mirror this morning, but obviously I need to get a new script writer. Um, <laughs> John Wesley understands salvation as the entire redeeming work of God in human life, and Wesley also believes that salvation is dependent upon our faith. Wesley describes faith as a, a new way of seeing it's a mode of sight by which people may perceive the previously unseen spiritual world. 
and become convinced of God and his work in our lives. Wesley notes that scripture refers to faith as light exhibited to the soul and a supernatural sight or perception. It is both a new faculty of vision and the light for the exercise of this faculty. Personally, I believe John Wesley was a practical theologian. Wesley's theological practice was to re respond to real issues and to focus on how God changes our lives. And in a very condensed version of Wesley's definition of salvation, he says it's a real change in a person's holiness of heart and their life. For United Methodist, salvation means that we are in an intimate relationship with God, a God who works throughout our lives to change our hearts and minds in order to make us whole. In their book, Living as United Methodist Christians by Andy and Sally Langford, they tell us that our salvation journey begins before we're even aware that God is seeking us. This is what we call in the United Methodist Church prevenient grace. At that moment, we understand that our lives are headed in the wrong direction. And we, we, when we say yes to God, this is what we call being justified, which means your sins are forgiven because you're currently running back to God for forgiveness. God then redirects us and empowers us to follow Jesus, and then we are living in what's called sanctifying grace. This is God's ongoing work in our lives in an effort to make us whole and perfect in our love towards God and towards our neighbor. Methodists believe that prayer, worship, and Bible study, we continue to grow closer to God. Through our mission and outreach to people in need, we continue to grow more loving. In other words, the Holy Spirit continues to work in us, helping us to become more perfect in our love of God and our love of neighbor. We differ from other denominations by believing that we can backslide from salvation. Other denominations believed that once saved, always saved. Well, why the difference? Well, I believe once saved, always saved leads to us to ignore the needs of others. It's this, I got mine, get yours attitude to salvation that we see so prevalent in our society today. To me, the most basic definition of a Christian is someone who believes Jesus needs to save the world from him or her. That's what it means to say that every Christian is a sinner on the path of redemption. And remember, the word sin means to miss the mark, to be walking down the wrong path, to rely solely on self-will or our superego. Christians should not ever, not ever claim to be morally superior to other people. The one thing that should distinguish us is that we know we are lost without a leg to stand on, aside from the fact that Jesus loves us enough to take the blame for our sin. Self-righteous Christians should not exist because self-righteousness is what we are supposed to be saved from. And so many Christians have become what Jesus came to earth to stop us from being. It's indicative of a massive theological failure and a complete misunderstanding of what our salvation is supposed to accomplish. In recent decades, many Christians have promoted a very individualistic, consumeristic account of Christian salvation. Basically, salvation has been made into a product that can be bought and sold called afterlife or fire insurance. According to this salvation description, God's justice demands that every human be tortured in hell forever after they die for punishment of their sin so that the only way out of this terrible fate is to get a heavenly hand stamp by the blood of Jesus by believing that he died solely for your sins emphatically enough, accepting him into your heart sincerely enough, letting him take the wheel decisively enough, obeying all his teachings enthusiastically enough, saying the official sinner's prayer loudly enough or some other confusing, 
combination of all these. The one place we don't see this jumbled up, anxiety-inducing so-called gospel message, the one place we don't see it is in the actual teachings of Jesus or Paul. In Acts 2.40, the apostle Peter pleaded with the crowd, crowd listening to his first sermon at the Jerusalem temple. He said, save yourselves, save yourself from this corrupt generation. He never asked them, if you die tonight, do you know if you're going to heaven or hell? Because to Peter, salvation wasn't about afterlife insurance. It was about being detoxified from the corruption in the world around him. 1 Peter 1.22 describes the goal of this salvation. It says, Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. Genuine mutual love is not just a pleasant byproduct of getting into heaven. It is heaven. Similar, similarly, when Jesus confronted Saul on the road to Damascus, he didn't say, accept me as your personal Lord and Savior, or else you'll be tortured forever after you die. In Acts 9, 4, Jesus said, Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus' offer to Saul wasn't a heavenly hand stamp to secure his admission into the right afterlife. Jesus offered Saul an invitation to stop being a jerk thus leaving his personal hell. Saul accepted this invitation, changed his name to Paul, and became an apostle. In the process of becoming Paul, Saul wasn't saved from anything outside of himself. Rather, Jesus saved the world from Saul by turning him in to Paul. This, the world is saved from each of us who become Christian in a similar way. The Wesleyan branch of Christianity emphasizes two aspects to salvation, justification and sanctification. Neither of these need to be understood in terms of a cheap or crude doctrine of afterlife insurance. Justification describes my process of coming to trust that Jesus' sacrifice for my sins on the cross has removed me, has removed my need to constantly justify myself and deny my flaws. Self-justification is, is the reason I occasionally act like a jerk. If I fully embrace the grace I have received from God, then I would fully embody grace in how I treat others. So what do I need to be saved from? I need to be saved from me. I need to be saved from my self-centeredness, from my selfishness, my need to control everything in my life. I need to be saved from judging you because you're different than me. I need to be saved from believing that God loves me more than he loves the Muslim or the Mexican or the African or the Jew or the homosexual. I need to be saved from believing that every morning I should receive my marching orders from cable news instead of the Gospels. I need to be saved from believing that I have all the right answers and you are always wrong. I need to be saved from believing that it's somebody else's responsibility to care for those in need. It's somebody else's responsibility to feed the hunger and house the homeless. What I desperately need is for God to save me from me. Amen.